right. Good morning. So great to see all of you. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Rick. I have the privilege to being one of the pastors here at Autumn Ridge Church. And I gotta tell you, I've been thinking a lot about church lately. And I would imagine that you would think, not a big surprise to your pastor, isn't that my job? But the reason that I've been thinking about church might be for reasons that you wouldn't expect. Right now, there's just a lot of people talking about church right now. And the way that people are talking about church, I gotta tell you, I've never really experienced it before in my life. My, my time in college studying theology, my time in seminary did not prepare me for it. Two decades of pastoral ministry really has not prepared me for it. I'm curious, how many of you guys are podcast listeners? Who likes, who likes podcasts? There are, I don't know how many podcasts there are. There are thousands upon thousands of podcasts. Did you know that the number four most listened to podcast in America was a podcast about a church? It was this one. The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. If you're not familiar with Mars Hill Church, it was a church located in Seattle from the late 1990s through the early 2010s. It was one of the fastest growing churches in our country. It was one of the largest churches in our country, and it was a church that had international influence. And the short version of the story is this, is that the pastor had some controversy surrounding him and that there were serious allegations of abuse and abuses of power. And today... This church no longer exists. Now, I know I don't sound like it, but I am from the South, the fried chicken South, and I grew up going to Southern Baptist churches. I was educated in a Southern Baptist college. I went to a Southern Baptist seminary. I was licensed and ordained into ministry in a Southern Baptist church. And very recently, and after a voluntary investigation, the Southern Baptist Convention, they revealed that they had mishandled and intentionally covered up hundreds upon hundreds of cases of abuse over decades. And the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest non-Catholic collection of churches in our country, and today they are under investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice. And it's not my intent to be a downer today, but could we acknowledge this, that it kind of seems like it's normal, maybe we're getting used to it, that for prominent church leaders, prominent Christian leaders that were just really getting used to stories of them admitting to or being exposed for trust-destroying behavior. It's for some heartbreaking reasons. A lot of people are talking about church. And people are talking about, well, what's gone wrong with churches in America? And other people are talking about, What is it going to take for things to go right for churches in America? What is it going to take for churches across this country to thrive? What is it going to take for churches across our country to be healthy? And some people say, you know, the problem is, the problem is churches are too traditional. And other people say, no, 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 the problem is churches are too trendy. And some people say the problem is that churches have become too masculine and they've been hurt by toxic masculinity. And other people say, no, actually the problem is churches are not masculine enough. They're too feminine. People say, you know what, the problem is the church has gotten too involved, too enmeshed with politics. And other people say, you know, that's actually not it. The problem is we haven't gotten involved enough. So you can see, we all agree. There's a lot of noise surrounding church today. And the narratives are dizzying. And it leaves me asking this question. What are we doing here exactly? I want to welcome you to a brand new series called This Is Church. Today and for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about church. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to dig into parts of the New Testament book of Ephesians. We call it a book, but really it was a letter. It was a letter written by a man named the Apostle Paul, and he wrote to local churches that met in the city of Ephesus, around the city of Ephesus, and in the region of Ephesus. And this letter that he wrote, it would have arrived at a church and they would have studied it and they would have read it together. And then they would have taken this precious letter and sent it to another local church and to another and then to another. And one of the main reasons that this letter was written and sent to these churches is to make sure that they were awakened to and that they understood all that they had been given and all that they had been called to in Christ. In Ephesians 1, we read this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened 
in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, he being Jesus, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. What is that power? What do we have? That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Before we can talk about church, the first thing we need to talk about, we need to talk about Jesus. And in the short passage that we just read, the Apostle Paul used three metaphors to describe Jesus. Did you recognize them? As Jesus is seated at God's right hand, all things are under his feet. and He's head over the church. And you're a smart crowd. You know that a metaphor, it's imagery that's not supposed to be taken literally, but is designed to communicate truth that is supposed to be taken literally. So the question is, what do these metaphors communicate? This first metaphor right here, seated at God's right hand, is about status. Jesus shares the same status as God because Jesus is God. Do you know what that means? It means that we cannot simply admire him. All the facts of history, all the eyewitnesses, all the source material that we have about Jesus, they shout to us in unison that we cannot simply admire him. He was not a good teacher. He was not a good man. He was God who took on what it meant to be a man. And we either worship him or we reject him. But what we can never be, we can never be casual about him. This one, all things under his feet, this is about authority. Now, how many things are under his feet? All things. All right. You guys are halfway in between Saturday night and the 8.30 service. Let's try this again. How many things are under his feet? All. All things. There we go. You sound like you believe it. Jesus is the ultimate authority over all things and over all people. And maybe the most profound question you're ever going to ask yourself in life is this. Who is the boss? Is it you? Do all things begin and end with your opinion? Or will you trust him and will you submit to Jesus as the authority, as your authority? And the last one is this, head over the church. And this is a metaphor, the metaphor of head or the metaphor of headship. It can mean two things. It can mean authority or it can mean something different. It can mean source. And I can understand we quickly probably in our culture, in our time period, we quickly go to this one because we talk about head over a household or we say she's the head of a company. That means she is the boss. And after all, we've already established that Jesus is the authority. So is that what Paul means? Well, in his language and in his culture and in this time period, this metaphor could mean two different things. And believe it or not, it means two different things in our culture and our language too. We say things like head of a river. That's a metaphor for source. So which truth was the Apostle Paul trying to communicate with this metaphor? The good news is we don't have to guess. We can just keep reading through Ephesians and see how Paul talks about Jesus and talks about the church, and his meaning will become clear. So let's do that. Moving out of Ephesians 1 and to Ephesians 2, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. That's our sin. It is by grace you've been saved. Jesus is the source of new life, and he's the source of our forgiveness for our sins. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, or we are his artwork, or we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus is the source of new life. He's the source of us being a new creation. Jesus is the source of a new identity. He's the source of our purpose. He has works for us to do. Let's keep moving forward. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Here the apostle Paul, like any good preacher, he just starts mixing up metaphors on you. 
And he started off talking about how we are the body and Jesus is our head. And now he's going to start talking about we're like a building and Jesus is the most important aspect of a foundation. He's the cornerstone. He says, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So what is it that Jesus does in us? What is it that Jesus does for us? He gives us new life. He joins us together. He gives us unity. He is building us into his temple where we are, where God resides. So what is the literal truth that Paul is communicating through the non-literal imagery? Jesus is the source of new life. He's the source of holiness. He's the source of forgiveness. He's the source of unity. He's the source of purpose. But just to make sure that we don't get out ahead of ourselves, let's keep looking. Let's make sure that we're understanding Paul for what he means. Ephesians 4 says this, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Jesus is the source of life. He's the source of our growth. He is the power that is the source for our maturity. He is nurturing us as we grow to be more like him and as we become more united with each other. So what does it mean that Jesus is head over the church? Jesus is the source of our new life, our new status, our love, our unity, and our purpose. And as we begin to understand what it is, what it means for Jesus to be our head, now we are able to pivot and look at what does it mean that we are his body. We look again at this verse that he is the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And there it is. We see it now. The imagery, the, the metaphor that Jesus is the source who fills. So what we're going to do for the next few minutes, we're going to zero in on what it means that he is the head, but more importantly, right now, our focus is that we are his body. Do you know why this is so incredibly important? Because this right here, this is church. And so if you're a note taker, I wanna ask you to write this down. Church is not a building, it's a body. Church is not a building, it's a body. And I would imagine that there are some of us who are thinking, yeah, I know, <laughs> been here before, got that figured out. And there might even be some of us who are saying, Rick, we get it. Can we kind of move past the childish observations and make a more substantive point? And I'll just be honest with you, there's part of me that feels like I'm being remedial. This feels a tad elementary, but at the risk of being annoying, can we just sit in this together for a moment? Church is not a building, it's a body. And I want to give you a challenge. I want to ask you, would you start paying attention to how do people use the word church and how do people talk about church? Keep track of it. Keep track of other people. Keep track of yourself. And I know this might seem like a silly challenge, but if you dare to take it seriously, I think you're going to discover something. And this is what it is. When church people talk about church, we almost never talk about church the way the New Testament does. Too often, too often the way we talk about church is, is wrong. What we are in right now is not church. This is not a church. This is a building. This is a resource that our church meets in, gathers in, and uses. And I can completely understand why someone would say, Rick, come on. It's just kind of a shorthand way of communicating. Everybody knows what we mean by church. Which I would say, I don't think so. I don't think that's true. If you were to Google what is church, which I did, this is the first thing that would pop up. Those of you guys who are pilots, you can read this. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, you could Google what is church later. This is what you're going to find. Two billion hits is the first thing that comes up. A building used for public Christian worship. How we talk is extremely important. Do you know why? Because how we talk about something is how we think about something. Our words, how we talk, is always a reflection of how we think. Two or three weeks ago, billions of people around this planet gathered together to celebrate that Jesus was born. And there is a word that we use 
There's a word that we use to describe what it means that Jesus took on humanity, that he literally took on a physical body to be with us. And that word is incarnation. And incarnation quite literally means to take on flesh, to take on a body. Did you know that Jesus passed on the incarnation to the church? Jesus said he was the temple. And now what do we read in Ephesians? We are the temple. We are his body. We represent him to the world. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated that Jesus is the light that has come into a world of darkness. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, you are the light of the world. You are to be like a city on a hill. And so if you would just hear me out, bear with me for a second. If for years and years, if we've just, not just here, but everywhere, gotten comfortable of talking about church as though it's a building. It means we think about church as though it's a building. And so this is my question. Are we experiencing any consequences for wrong thinking about church? I think we are. Here, but not just here, it's just everywhere. We talk about church as it's something that you go to. Here, but not just here, everywhere. I think church has been reduced to an event. This worship service right now, this is not church. It's something our church does, but it's not church. Like many of you, my son and I have been snow blowing our driveway a lot lately. And we're getting really good at it. We can do it fast. We can get it done before he goes to school. Uh, we're not available to come to your house. Um, but we're good at it now. Snow blowing the driveway is something we do. It's not who we are. A worship service like this. It's something that our church does. It should flow out of who we are. But a worship service is not church. And I want to share with you what I think, and you have every right to take it or leave it. If you think I'm wrong, you could be right and I could be wrong. I'm just going to share with you what I think. I think the way that basically everywhere we've been talking about church has made us vulnerable to think about church like consumers. And it's just easy to think about church as something we go to to get something. And this mindset, it's kind of taken hold in big churches and small churches. It's taken hold in really traditional churches and really trendy churches. And I don't think it's because we're bad, and I don't think it's because we're dumb. I think that this might just be a natural consequence for letting something other than the New Testament be the framework for how we talk about church. Church is not a place. It's a people gathered in a place. And for those of you who are watching us online right now, this might create a bit of an awkward moment. Now, this might create somewhat of a provocative question. For those of you who are watching online, or for those of you who ever participate online, the question is this, what about digital church? What about online church? And that deserves probably a much longer conversation, but allow me to say this. Digital church is an incomplete alternative, not an invalid one. It's an incomplete alternative, not an invalid alternative, when gathering physically isn't an option. But right now, the thing that I think needs our attention is this. Church is not a place. It's a people gathered in a place. If you begin reading in the New Testament, start in the book of Acts and go all the way to the last page of the New Testament. Almost 100% of the content is in the context of a local church. Even when something, a letter or book, is written to an individual, it's always intended to be read with that person's church. And this profound realization is part of what led this church almost 20 years ago to change its name from First Baptist to a location-based name. This church is not a place, but it's a people gathered in a place. And church is not simply people. Church is, a local church is a people, and I really want to emphasize this. It's a people. Church is the gathering and the uniting of people from different racial backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds. A local church is the gathering and the uniting of people who were once divided by anything and everything that you can imagine. But when you are connected to the one true head of the church, 
You become a member of his body and you become one with everyone else who is a part of his body. Did you know? Did you know that we are supposed to be just as connected to each other as we are to Jesus? Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, for he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its command and its regulations. So what we're going to read is the Apostle Paul is saying that the thing that made people hostile with God, Jesus has resolved that. And the thing that's made people hostile with each other, Jesus has resolved that. Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Did you know that it was Jesus' plan all along? It was his on-purpose idea. It was his intent to bring people together who were hostile to each other and make them one new humanity in him. Have you ever felt hostile to people at church? Tell the truth. Jesus is watching right now. Who's ever felt annoyed by people at church? Anybody? A couple of you and a whole bunch of liars. <laughs> Have you ever found yourself thinking, what are they thinking? Probably not in this church, but in other churches, sometimes people get mad at each other. Sometimes people even get mad at the pastor. Can you believe that? <laughs> What's going on? This is Jesus' plan from the beginning. He just decided, I'm going to bring together people who don't like each other. I'm going to make them one. And in this passage that we just read, who are the two kind of different groups that Paul is talking about? He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And if you don't know, you need to know. Because they were peoples who were, who were divided by deep, nasty, pervasive hostility for cultural reasons, racial reasons, and religious reasons. But they are together together. And they are now one new humanity in Christ. If the Apostle Paul were writing to churches in America today, I would imagine that he would talk to people who felt deep animosity and division for different political reasons. He would say, hey, we're all one in Christ. I imagine he would talk about racial history and, and racial hostilities and divisions and say, just remember, you're all now one in Christ. I would imagine that he would write and talk to us about churches who, who structure themselves in different ways, who have different ideas and opinions about a worship expression and music styles and say, hey, you're all one in Christ. Because when we are connected to the head, we become one new humanity, united, together, loving, peaceful, in him. It is impossible to overstate how radical this is. It is impossible to overstate how unnatural this is. James W. Thompson is a leading biblical scholar and an author, and I want to share with you something that I read from him. He said, Paul's task is unprecedented in antiquity, the creation of a corporate identity for converts whose only common interest was the conviction that Jesus suffered, died, and was raised from the dead, separated believers from the communities from which they had come. What were those communities? The family, the clan, the tribe, the civic assembly. And brought them together with those whom they did not choose. And so I think it might be helpful to think about church in this way. Doesn't that help? I know some of you guys are thinking, amen, pastor, that's so good. I want you to think about the big circle. This is a local church. Big circle is a local church. And everybody inside of that circle, people who have trusted in Jesus, have given their allegiance to Jesus, they're now part of his body. And there are different groups that come together, people with different backgrounds, things that make them different. And as the eyes of our hearts are enlightened, as we become aware of, of all that we've been given in Christ and what we've been called to in Christ, all the things that make us different and distinct from each other, they begin to move to the background. And it begins to look like this as those differences diminish. And it's not like the things that make us different and distinct, it's not like they totally disappear because that's just not true. 
For the people who were Jewish in the church in Ephesus and they gave their allegiance to Christ, they didn't stop being Jewish because they're now in Christ. The people who were Gentiles, they didn't stop being Gentiles because they're now in Christ. And it's the same for us. If you're white and you give your allegiance to Christ, you're going to stay being white. Can't change it. I've tried. Still, no rhythm. (laughs) If you're black and you are in Christ, you're still going to be black. If you came and you have all kinds of different political ideologies and commitments, those things may not change, and that's okay. You can still be one in Christ. There are all kinds of different preferences and wants and desires that we have that make us distinct. Maybe things that we wish our church would be this way or we wish it would be that way. That's okay. You don't necessarily have to get rid of those. Those things don't disappear. But you got to hear me on this. The things that make us distinct and different, it's not that they disappear. It's that they no longer divide us. We don't fight about what other people fight about. We don't fight about things that we used to fight about. The most important aspect of our identity is that we are in Christ. We are his body. It's who we are. And he is making us into one new humanity. Together, unified, loving, and peaceful. Our church values taking truth seriously. I know you do. We value taking truth seriously. And so this is what I want to do. I want to step into some, what might feel like some nitty-gritty truth. Would that be okay? Let's do that. Anytime a church goes through major transition and major disruption, which our church has, and what I'm going to talk about, this is true for every church. Every church in the world has to face this from time to time. This is not u- unique to us. Anytime a church goes through major transition or goes through major disruption, which many churches have, it's easy to forget. We become vulnerable to forgetting what it is that makes us one and we can return to looking more like this. But this is only half of it. Because whenever a church goes through a major transition or major disruption, and ours like many others have, we don't just forget what makes us one. We can actually revert back to fighting for and fighting about what makes us distinct and different from one another. And what ends up happening is one group decides to raise the flag for their issue, the thing that makes them distinct, and they begin to advocate for that thing that makes them different from the others. And then another group does the same. And then another group does the same. And if a local church isn't careful, what is supposed to be the body of Christ can become a collection of tribes in which everyone has raised the flag for their individual group's issue, and they're advocating for their way, even at the expense of other groups in the body of Christ. And so the question is, if a church found that it had drifted here, but they wanted to return to this, how would they do that? The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church who had forgotten this. He actually wrote numerous letters to this church. It was a local church that met in the city of Corinth. And we're going to read part of one of the letters that he wrote to them. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Every once in a while, I hear something. When I hear this, it's always weird to me, and I'm starting to hear it again. And the thing that I hear that's strange to me is when people say, church is for Christians. It's not. The church is the body of Christ. So this is the audience participation point. Are we for ourselves? Who are we for? Who are we for? Him church is for Jesus. We are for him. And so for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have given our allegiance to him. We are in him. When we gather together, it's not about us. When we have a worship service like this one, it's not about us. When we sing songs or we listen to preaching, it's not about us. 
when we host things like ARC18, our Ridge Fest. It's not about us. When we pack our bags, go to the other side of the globe on a mission trip, it's not about us. When we gather together in small groups, it's not about us. When we receive an offering and we give financially, even when we make decisions to sacrificially give financially, it's not about us. Whenever we do all the countless things that we might do, it is never about us. It is good for us, so good for us. But it's not about us. It is about him. It is for Jesus. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The ones we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Our perspective has changed. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, greatest line ever written in human history, not counting people's sins against them. Has anybody ever held something against you? Has anyone ever held something against you and they won't let it go? God knows everything there is to know about you. And in Christ, none of it is held against you or held against me. And he has given us this message of reconciliation. This is the most important thing. It's the most important thing for our church. It's the most important thing for every church. It's the most important thing for any church anywhere. The, the message, the ministry of reconciliation, everything else, everything else is a distant second to this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Did you know that God is making his appeal to the world, his appeal for forgiveness, his appeal of love, his, his call to Christ? Did you know he's making it through you and through me? So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I want to implore you. I want to implore everybody who's in this room, everyone who might be watching us online. If you have not trusted in Christ, if you have not received new life in Christ, would you trust in him today? What could hold you back from receiving this incredible gift of God not holding your sins against you? But this is experienced in him, in faith in Christ, would you give your life to him? Would you become a part of the body of Christ? And for those of us who would say, Rick, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've given my, I've given my life to him. It's my prayer that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would be reminded of We'd be energized by what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And any other thing that maybe has clouded our thinking or polluted our thinking, that we would turn from that, repent from that, and recommit ourselves to what it means to be the body of Christ. Do you know why this is so incredibly urgent? The answer to that question is going to be our thesis that we repeat throughout this series, our constant drumbeat. The reason this is so urgent is because there is no backup plan. This is is Jesus' plan for his people. This is Jesus' plan for the church. We are his body. And may we be people who talk about and think about church in the way that he does. May we be a people, may we be a new humanity in him. And may we be people who joyfully walk forward into what it means to be the body of Christ. Christ.